Hi, my name is Dominic and this is my JS13K entry for 2021. I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, so let's just call it quick. This game was done as a tribute to the original Quake from 1996 and uh, it doesn't really match the competition's theme, but I really, really wanted to do this, so here we are. Um, quick features, two levels, five types of enemies, three different weapons, 30 different textures, um, a robust collision detection. Not so smart, but not completely dumb AI. Um, some nice ambient music and spatial audio. I want to go into some more detail about how all the data fits into the game, how the textures, levels and models are stored. Let's start with the levels. I had some experience with building levels, or maps as we called them, for Quake 3. Since I was aiming to reproduce parts of Quake 1, I thought using a map editor for Quake would be a good fit. Back in the day we used a tool called Radiant, and while it wasn't really bad, in hindsight it feels a bit clunky. So this is Trench Broom. It's a map editor for various Quake Engine games made by Christian Duske, and I can't say enough nice words about it. It's really, really good. It's completely free and open source, so go check it out. While Quake maps allow for all kinds of funky geometry, I limited myself to only use axis-aligned blocks. These blocks can be quite small to allow for stair steps or some details in the maps, but they can also be huge. One block can cover the floor or the ceiling of multiple rooms. I was able to capture most of the famous E1-M1 map from Quake 1, the Slipgate Complex, with just about 200 of these blocks. I have to admit though that the original map comes with a lot of secret passages and rooms that I wasn't able to fit in. So these 200 blocks can be stored in a binary file with just 7 bytes each. One byte for the x, y and z coordinates of the block and one byte for the width, length and height and another byte for the texture index. These binary files with all the blocks are loaded in JavaScript into a big array buffer and all the vertices for WebGL are constructed from it. The entities, so all the things that are in the map, the light sources, the enemies, ammo and health boxes and so on, are stored with one byte each for the type ID, uh, three bytes for the position and two extra bytes for some extra attributes. For instance, for the light sources, one of these extra bytes is used for the brightness and one is used for the color value. So with all this, uh, in the end I managed to squeeze in two maps uh, using up a whopping 3.2 kilobytes in the zip file. The models for the game again are stored in the simplest way possible. It's just a set of 3 byte coordinates defining the vertices and then a list of indices where each three indices define one triangle or face of the model. Uh, for the animated models, the list of vertices is just repeated for each animation frame. I was able to get away with very few animation frames by just linearly interpolating between them. I was using Winx 3D to create those models. Um, I exported them as a wavefront object file and converted them into a binary file with a PHP script. It's not really a good workflow and I really should learn a bit of Blender. Next up, textures. This was probably the best idea I had for this game. Instead of creating the textures as PNG files and just saving them in the zip, um, the textures are created on the fly as canvas elements when you first load up the game. This idea is nothing new. The demo scene has done it since forever, but I falsely assumed that you needed some complex operations to achieve good results with generated textures. Um, nevertheless, I tinkered a bit with the idea and after some promising first results with drawing random stuff on canvas elements, um, I built a really simple editor to create those textures. And I mean really, really simple. This editor just supports five different operations. You can draw a rectangle, you can draw a grid of rectangles, you can draw some random noise, draw text, or draw a previous texture. Um, in the end, I was quite surprised myself uh, with the results you can get with this. It was really unexpected. Also, it turned out to be a lot of fun to build those textures. The result of all this is a JSON array that defines those textures, all 30 of them, and a tiny library that reads this array and spits out canvas elements. The whole thing is on GitHub, it's called Tiny Texture Tumblr if you want to check it out. 
Uh, I won't go into detail of how the music is stored, but the short version is that it's similar to the textures. Uh, it's just a JSON array of notes that gets rendered into an audio buffer. So with all the data out of the way, I had about 5.9 kilobytes left for the code. I want to show just two things uh, in the code in particular, and one of those things is the renderer. I'm using WebGL to draw everything onto the screen, and everything in, through in the game world is spit out to the GPU for each frame. There's no occlusion culling or fancy math to figure out the visibility, and it doesn't really matter, computers are fast. Uh, the renderer uses only one shader program for everything, so all the enemies uh, and the whole game world are drawn with the same shader. The vertex shader handles the view rotation, the direction you look at, um, the view position, the object's position, the object's rotation, and blending between two animation frames for an object. Of course, it's inefficient to draw the static world geometry of a shader that can blend animation frames and rotate geometry, but Again, it doesn't really matter. Computers are fast. The fragment shader applies a uniform array of light coordinates and light colors to every pixel and does little else. Uh, it does this in a loop, one iteration for each light source. So the number of lights in the game is uh, fixed to 32. And to stay within this limit, the lights are faded out after a certain distance. Uh, you can see this fade out in a few parts of the game, but honestly I think it looks cool and it adds to the atmosphere. It's a feature, not a bug. Uh, completely unrelated to rendering, here's the collision detection routine that is executed for each entity, for each frame. Uh, this is very similar to what I was doing in my previous game, Underrun, but this time I'm doing it in three dimensions instead of two. But the idea is the same. First you remember the current known good position of an entity. You advance this position according to the entity's velocity, then you test if the final x position of this entity with the old y and old z position collides. If yes, you roll back the final x position to the old position, and then you do the same thing for the y and z coordinates. Checking each of the three axes individually instead of just doing one test with the final position uh, allows you to slide along the floor and walls, and it turned out to be really robust. Um, the real code that is used in the game does a bit more stuff, uh, in particular it checks if we can step up a staircase or if an entity needs to bounce off uh, from the ground. This is used for the bouncy credits, for instance. But the gist is the same. It's just a bunch of uh, simple checks, no complex math stuff going on. There's one last thing I want to get into, and that's keyboard input. If you do WASD movement in your game, I urge you to use the keyboard events code property. This property is keyboard layout agnostic, which means WASD works on French keyboards and ZNY keys are not switched on German keyboards. The code property basically reports the key based on the US keyboard layout, so you're defining your keys by the position on the keyboard, no matter what layout is actually used in the end. So the user's local keyboard layout is completely ignored, which is exactly what you want for your games. That's about it. If you're interested in some more detail about the game, I wrote a making of post uh, on my blog, phoboslab.org. Uh, thanks for watching and see you next year.